How long have you been, have you had this uh, project in mind, Jim? Well, actually, Jim, we were talking about eight, I think, eight years ago, yeah. and uh, he said a lot of things were going to start coming out about his life, uh, books, movies, and he said, you know, I know how much you love the Stooges, and if someone were to make a Stooges film, I think it'd be great if it was you. Yeah. And I was like, okay, the next day, I'm just going to figure out how am I going to do with this film. But uh, it took quite a while. Um, I, I first was financing it myself. Uh, Carter Logan, our incredible producer, was there for the whole time organizing it. Contributing to a lot of things in the film, but um, after a certain point, he said, "You know, Jim, uh, you spent like I don't know, almost forty grand. You're running out of money, of your own money." So we had to stop for a while. We made a film called Only Lovers Left Alive. We, uh, we were working again on Give Me Danger. Then we got uh, independent in. England to help us find financing, and then Bart Walker found us uh, Fernando Sulichin, who was our angel and financed the film. Then we had to stop again and made Patterson. Mm -hmm. um, then we had about a year and a half with, of licensing all the stuff in this film, and uh, that was incredible work. Uh, Ariel de saint and others had to also find when we couldn't license certain things, we had to remove it, replace it. That was about a year and a half of incredible work on their part. So yeah, it was a long time, but when I, I told Jim a few times, well, it's coming, it's just coming slow, you know? And, and you said at one point, it's not a time-sensitive thing, it's the Stooges, so just as long as you're working on it. So we, I said, it's gonna come. I would, I would call him about every six months, you know, just to let him know I cared. But you don't want to, you don't when you work with a creative person, you don't want to push them ever, mm -hmm. never, never, never. You know. So. Yeah. How far back do you guys go? Hey. How far back do you guys go? When did you? Nineties, uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, like twenty-five years. Yeah, maybe. something like that. We were in Somewhere. Vietnam together. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Not that, that far back. Yeah. We survived the Lower East Side. Right. <laughs> yeah. You can survive the new Lower East Side. That's <laughs> I heard recently that um, Williamsburg is the new East Village. Right. Oh, no, the new East Village. Right. One or the other. Uh, <laughs> The East Village is the new Williamsburg. Yeah. I'm confused. Yeah. Somebody Google it to find out. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? <laughs> yeah. Do we see a new uh, Iggy Pop concert going, coming to New York? Iggy Pop coming to New York, a new co concert. What you got a date in, have you got a date coming up in New York? Uh, I was just here. This, you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was this spring at uh, United Palace. Yeah. It was amazing. Oh, Great. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm coming for other things, but not to play a concert, as far as I know. I kind of need to go nappy now for a little while. <laughs> He says that, but in two days he's heading to South America. It's touring, so he doesn't stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buy your ticket. Right now. Yeah. Sounds like uh, from what you said of the film, the song uh, Dumb Dumb Boys might have been written about the Ashton Brothers. Did I glean that from what you said about that song? Uh, it's not just the Ashtons, uh, James Williamson is in there too, that's, uh, what happened to James? He's going straight. So. <laughs> He's in there too, but, uh, yeah, and, um, the, uh, the title, the uh, David Bowie suggested the title. I had the piece of music, and, 
uh, it's written D-U-M, and at the time that was a, like, a lot like the early Stooges mus music, that was a popular kind of what they called a, a humane bullet that was being used in Northern Ireland. And uh, it would hit you and knock you, kind of like a taser. It, it would knock you down hard, but might not actually kill you or, or hopefully not break the flesh. And there was, there was something in that music and in that lyric and about our whole group, especially the original group, before we got hyped up that was kind of recessive, uh, except for me. And uh, I was the one who would uh, kind of come forward and uh, I, I try to pull, pull in some sort of a public, basically, to be honest about it. Monkey style. <laughs> Uh, it was when initially did, question when did Jim first hear about the Stooges? Yeah, I'm from Akron, Ohio, and the suburbs of Akron. And uh, as a young teenager, a friend, an older brother of a friend, had a secret stash of stuff under his bed, which included some interesting things to us, like. Uh, I remember he had a <coughs> Naked Lunch by William Burroughs and Candy by Terry Southern, wow. a Coltrane record, uh, a Mothers of Invention record, and the first Stooges record. And uh, these were incredible things to us. Uh, and the Stooges, and of course, subsequently, very soon after the MC5 for me, discovering them were really huge because, you know, we were, it was a small group of us. We were into, uh, you know, we knew the British music and we knew the West Coast stuff, but it didn't speak to us in the way. I mean, the Stooges, the MC5, that's Michigan, that's Detroit, that's working class stuff. And uh, that was the stuff that really hit, hit and stayed with me ever since. And, a big resurgence, of course, when I moved to New York in the mid to late 70s, and the Stooges, of course, were undeniably influential then. But yeah, pretty early, I remember the first Stooges album, I remember the cover, I remember all, the, all those songs. He had to hide it under his bed? This, this yeah, and, um, of, like, he, his bed stuff? He hid the good stuff, I think, so his parent, you know, it was like, it, and it made it seem more clandestine. Was. But these were like keys to escape from Akron, like this kind of stuff was for us, yeah, it, it was hidden away. I mean, we were like 13 or 12. You had like Mormon Tabernacle Choir records outside, you know. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. outside. Yeah. Like, you know. Those weren't clandestine. No, not at all. They should have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jim Farad. kitchen mm -hmm. in uh, Ann Arbor and he was a he was a a kind of a, a classic high quality American young man uh, who dressed in a kind of a mid-Atlantic style uh, <laughs> he could have he could have sat down and, and had a debate with William Buckley about something, but he, but he, but 
but he played his sax as if he was under the influence of LSD, which he was. <laughs> <laughs> and with the chops of uh, not unlike Junior Walker or Maceo Parker. So I convinced him to come and, uh, and join the group to play on that album. And it was really for that album. And then from there on, he, uh, he played with us live for a while, but there was, groups have a certain instrumentation, each one that, that really, that, that really highlights their identity. And in our group, a saxophone was for about half of the gig, but not for every song. And so Steve wanted to play more. And at one point he asked, listen, I want to play on every song. And, and I, I wasn't ready to do that. And eventually the group exploded for the ninth time anyway. So, uh, but. When we, when we reunited, uh, Steve played something on every song, and I was very happy about that. And he was, he was just a, 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 how often do you meet a nice person right. and That's you right. still think they're nice 40 years later? How often in life? And this was just a very nice man, just a sweet man. Uh, it's such a mind fuck to have the Stooges playing Alice Tully Hall. Thank you, thank you, Jim Jarmusch. My question to Iggy, Jim. Jim. What, what's Alice Tully Hall? <laughs> <laughs> My question to Jim is to, to, to uh, Jim Osterberg is that the part in the film where, you, where Harry Potch talks about his instruments, I wondered, your body has always been an integral instrument in the band. What is your relationship to your body as an instrument? I started in music as a drummer, mm -hmm. and uh, before I was a drummer, I was a little kid, I would take my, uh, you remember Tinker Toys or Lincoln Logs, anybody? Well, I would take my Tinker Toys and Link Lincoln Logs and take them out, dump them out of the box and beat on the boxes with the Lincoln Logs and Tinker Toys, so uh, uh, I love rhythm. And uh, when, uh, when, when the Stooges started getting together, I was playing several instruments and I fired myself because I wasn't that good. The only thing left to do was front the band. <laughs> and uh, the original thing that I tried to do with my body was basically light a fire under these guys. <laughs> and when I did that, um, I think, I don't know where that came from. It maybe came from like, I was a guy at the sock hop who would like drop the girl, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, I still never learned to do, uh, you know, a, a foxtrot or anything. I, I can dance, you know, and so when I got in the group, I just reverted to the drums. I refer to the drums, to the drums, 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 and the one, the <clears throat> And I play off the one. Uh, sometimes I think I'm James Brown. Sometimes I think I'm an American Indian. Sometimes I think I'm Jerry Lewis, whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, I just try to use my body to, uh, to kind, of, kind of like a funnel to uh, focus the music that's going on and then shoot it out somewhere else. Uh, I didn't sit down and think that up one day. It just kind of happened night after night, and you know, bars and church basements, and that's about the best way I could put it. 
at that, and then sometimes, you know, if there's a, if there's an expressive wide passage being played by the guitarist, it might help if someone does that. It might help. It helps, can help pe other people to understand or to, to react in their own way. I guess. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I'm sorry to say we've got to go. There's so much more to talk about, but thank you. <laughs> yeah.